All right, welcome. I hope you are doing incredible this morning. Thank you so much for joining us here. If it's your first time to Rockfish Church, welcome. We are on part two of a sermon series entitled Glow, Where the Dark Meets the Light. If you missed this, or maybe if it's your first time, or you were not here last week, please go back and take a look at this message on YouTube. You can see it on uh, our main YouTube channel, or I don't know if you know this, but Aberdeen and Anderson Creek both have individual channels inside of our YouTube channel. So you can see the sermons as they are shared at every single location, every single Sunday. Those are, those are kind of posted incrementally, but please catch up on this series. And the reason it's important is because if you missed part one and you don't understand the reality of our current condition, then you will be void the urgency necessary to motivate you into activity, and, and, and that's what this sermon is about. I'm not here to beat anybody up. Um, I'm not here to, to shame anybody. What I want to do is paint a very clear picture. What we desire to do is, is to paint a very clear picture on, the, on, on our responsibility <clears throat> and our opportunities as God's body in this earth. We often hear that we are the body of Christ in the earth, and it's, it's true. We talked about last week the culture and its condition. We talked about uh, the vital statistics that, that show the condition of the world as well as the condition of the church, which should be a major contrast. But the, but the sad reality is it is not necessarily the major contrast that it should be. When Kevin was talking about revival, revival or judgment or adjustment or repentance or awakening always begins in the house of God. In the book of Judges, when, when the world was falling apart and Israel needed God, when they turned to God, their lives changed. And as a result, the way nations dealt with them transitioned simultaneously. But until there was transformation and transition of the nation of Israel, the same thing with the church. Our culture, whether we like it or not, is a reflection of the condition of the church. And most of us in here, if you are a believer and have been saved for more than three minutes, would say the direction of our culture is downward. That's because the health of our church the health of the church body has been spiraling for decades. Again, I, I, I'm, I say this based on empirical evidence. I'm not saying this based on opinion. I'm saying this based on the foolishness that is coming out of a lot of pulpits that is absolutely contrary to the Word of God. Let me preface this as I did last week. One, I love the church. Okay, I, when I say church, I mean capital C. But it doesn't mean that, that I overlook things that are, that are not right in the church. I'm not here to judge other churches, but I am here to make sure that we herald a consistent standard, and that standard is the Word of God. When we begin to deviate from that thing, from that bad things happen. We, we talked about whether morals and ethics were possible apart from God. Can you have morality apart from God? You cannot have morality that works in the context of reality apart from God. Can you have superficial, uh, culturally imposed, socially imposed morality? You absolutely can. And we're seeing that happen in America. And as a result, we're seeing the chaos and the, and the calamity that ensues. Um, we discussed, again, and this is the most important, I believe, for us, the most prudent for us is the role of the church. Now, I want to talk to you about this particular aspect of, of, the, of this series. And, and I, this is, every, every part of this series is important. Today is going to be important, next week is going to be important, and the final, or four, week four is going to be incredibly important. If there is any way you can be present for week four, please do not miss week four of this sermon series. Week four, we are going to be unveiling some, some brand new opportunities and some brand new methodologies that is going to take all of this and put it right in your hands. It's going to put, right, it's going to put well within your grasp the ability to glow like never before. And we're going to help you do that. I believe that comes as a result of making the Great Commission a corporate obsession. I got a call a few minutes ago. Or earlier today, a text a little earlier together, and there's a statement that you, many of you, if you've been through Starting Point, you've probably heard me say, until the Great Commission becomes a corporate conviction, it will remain unfulfilled. Well, we change the terminology here to a corporate obsession because it should be that conviction or lack of that expresses itself in, a, in, a, in an obsession. An obsession is something that you do. A conviction is something that you hold. 
If an obsession is not the natural outflow of the conviction, it may not be a true conviction. Did you hear what I just said? So here at Rockfish, you've, you've heard me speak or many of the speakers speak in context about how, and you learned this again in starting point, how that your values determine your culture, right? Whatever it is you value will determine the culture that you have, whether it's your home, whether it's in your job, or whether it's in your church. If you value kids, you'll have kids. If you value men and women, you will have men and women. If you value worship, you'll have worship. And, and it's obvious. It becomes very, very obvious. If you value peace in your home, you have peace in your home. If you value chaos and being right in your home and, 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 and all that, you, you got a divorce. You, what you sow, Jesus said, is what you reap. So what you value determines your culture. So, so we say that we value outreach. We say that we value what God values. But does our culture reflect it in the church? You could go to any church in America. You could go to any church within a 20-mile radius of this organization right now, and you would say, do you value the Great Commission? And I, and I guarantee you, their mission statement or their vision statement in some way reflects what Jesus said, his last commandment, his great commission, go into all the world and make disciples. But the question is, is it a part of that culture? That tells me if it's truly a value. So let me ask you this. If obedience to God's singular call of the great commission to the capital C church, the individual church, and the individual Christian is go into all the world and make disciples. Is that great commission a personal conviction? Because if it's not, it will never be a corporate or individual obsession whatsoever. It will never be a priority. Now, here's where we pull off the veil of delusion and say this. If you're not leading people to Christ, if you're not making disciples, you are not, you're not engaging in the primary call that God has extended to you as a believer. Somebody did or you wouldn't be here. You must or people will never be here. When I say here, I'm not talking about rockfish. I'm talking about it in that place where their lives are yielded to Christ and conformity and transformation is happening and life change is happening in them. Until that happens, it'll never happen in the culture. Statistics tell me that 90% of the people in this room have never led somebody to Jesus Christ. Look, I, I, again, I'm not saying this to shame you, but statistically, if I were to say how many of you in this room right now have shared the gospel explicitly as outlined in the, in the word of God with somebody in the last one year, less than 10% of you would raise your hand. Again, I, I'm not going to do that because that's not, that's not what this is about. But we must embrace that reality and see that this sermon, this message is not for the person next to me. This, this, this will never be a great corporate obsession if it's not something else first. And that's an individual priority. It will never be an individual commitment. It will never be a corporate obsession. So I'm, I'm setting this as a value of this organization, as a value of Rockfish Church, not just here. But every single location today is saying the same thing to every group. You're an extension of one body, and that body is the body of Christ. So making the Great Commission a corporate uh, obsession. It says, in the same way, and this is our verse, it says, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven, Matthew 5, 16. This entire series is dedicated to answering the questions, this question, how do we do that on an individual and on a corporate, on a corporate level? The world needs help and the world needs hope. And I believe with all of my heart that Jesus brings both. You know, people ask me, what is the, what is the mission statement of Rockfish Church? We, we exist to make, equip, and release fully committed followers of Jesus. That's good, that's good, that's good. But why? Do you know why? Because we really, really believe that Jesus Christ is the hope of the world. That he has the answers that the culture often that chews us up, spits us out, the circumstances often that, that destroy and disrupt our lives, they are, they are well within the power of, of restoration through the person of Jesus Christ. I believe with every fiber of my being that Jesus Christ is not only a, but the hope of this world. That's why. 
That's why making, equipping, and releasing disciples who are making disciples is so important to me and should be to you because it truly is the hope of the world. It is the only hope of the world, the only viable hope of the world. He didn't say, I am a way, or it would have changed everything. It would all be copacetic. But he said, I am the way. You say, well, Pastor Tony, that's exclusive. Yes. And so is an emergency exit. Do you see where it is? It's right back there over that door. And I'm going to tell you, if this place catches on fire, I'm going to point you to one of these two exits, and you're not going to argue with me about that being the only way out, are you? Right. Well, this world is burning. There's only one exit. All right. So, if we think about it, it's all about the one in two contexts. It's all about one in the context of, of, of one can make a difference. And if that one doesn't do anything, nothing's ever going to happen. And it's all about one in a little different context. Before, before I go on, I want to back up. As, as we were in worship, we think about God in this way. And I'm going to try to hurry. I'm not going to try to keep you too long today. I say that every time. Please forgive me. I didn't lie. Jesus, forgive me. Anyway, we think about God as being proximity-wise, as sometimes he's closer than others. You, you can hear it in our songs. It's something that we, it's a mental construct that we have. What if I told you God is, God is never geographically closer at any time than any other time? What if I told you God feels all in all and he is constantly here? He's an ever-present help in time of need. What if I told you that? But let me tell you what changes. What changes is our awareness and our attentiveness to his presence. See, when we prioritize his presence through the neglect and the distraction of the things of this world, his presence becomes beautiful and valuable and powerful. Well, it's the same thing with the Great Commission. It's the same thing with making disciples. It never changes. The Great Commission has been, has been inherent since day one when Jesus said, go into all the world. But, but very often, let's be honest, it's not at the forefront of our acknowledgement, right? We can take it or leave it. We squeeze it in from the time we go to work and then we go to lunch and maybe we might talk to somebody at lunch and then we, we get off and, and we go home and then we have our time because that's what we need in America. We need our time. Uh, there's a parable I'll share with you later, perhaps, concerning our time and God's opinion of our time. But very often, if, if we are not attentive to it, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. See, God's with you whether you feel like it, whether you're thinking about it or not. He's directing every step and every circumstance in your life. Some, are you, some of you are in tough circumstances now because he wants to prepare you adequately for the tougher circumstances to come. You understand, he's there. But as you acknowledge him, you learn about his plan and his methodology and the personal love that he has for you in the middle of that. And it just changes life and how we do it. Same thing about the commission. It's there. It's real, it's necessary, and it's vital. All about one. Here's the reality that, that we may or may not consider, and I think it's very, usually it's much later in the, in the Christian experience than what I think it should be. But we were born or birthed into an active war zone, a very real conflict, a very real struggle between good and, e and evil with real people and real souls that had real that have real consequences. People talk to me very often about free will. Well, does man have free will? Does man not have free will? Let me explain something to you. Whether you have free will or not, let me tell you, you have real consequences because God didn't place us into a creation, into a, into a toy wind-up creation that he's really pulling all the strings and making it all happen and we're just going through the motions because your real choices have real consequences in a real world. There's real pain. This is not fake. Do you understand? This is not a delusion or a dream. It was God's methodology, and he placed us in this methodology, and he gave us the ability to make consequences that would affect us real, in real ways right now. If we think for one moment that he put us in this context with real consequences to real decisions that we make, what makes you think that it's not going to be consistent with that in eternity? What do I mean by that? It means the real choices that you make today affect you today in the natural and the real choices that you make in the spirit affect you now and for eternity in the spiritual. This is a real world. We might not think about it because this war isn't 
right now being fought with bullets and swords and, and armor and weaponry. But it's a very real battle that every one of us were birthed into, and most of us were birthed into it in extreme ignorance. We need to be desperate, and we need to be relentless in our mission to rescue those who were held hostage outside of this camp. Do you understand that even this place right here is a spiritual and natural oasis for people? It's a safe place for people to come, a place where they can hear truth that is, is, is separate from, from broke, hopefully separate from broken agenda and manipulation. You can come here because you're not hearing my opinion on things. You're hearing the transformative, empowering word of God, which is, which is consistent with God in heaven, which is consistent not just now but through all eternity. See, the beauty of the Bible is it doesn't just work now on earth. It will work also in heaven. So if you hate it here on earth, you're not going to like heaven a whole lot. You understand? All right. So he's using... I think it's important that we realize that the enemy has captives. And they are real captives with real consequences. And he's deployed a lot of snares and a lot of things all around us. And, and, but we don't really realize to the degree that we're at war. Uh, I, I think that the enemy even now is using more and more stuff. And circumstantially, we're going to see some crazy calamity as we see the day approaching because there's a sense of desperation. You know, I was talking to the leaders as we were praying for this service and the other sites and all the churches in the area this morning. And I said, guys, I, somebody come to me and they were sharing this, this horrific prophecy about the stock market collapsing and, and, and war and all this stuff. And I said, well, you know what? Praise God. That's okay. Because it doesn't affect our commission, our mission one bit. Do you understand? Any calamity or circumstances that come into your life, they, they should not change the trajectory of your life. Our life is not ours. Our mission is not ours. It may affect our methodology, but it should never affect our mission. God's called us to make, to make disciples. It's like Rockfish Church. Rockfish Church, as long as it exists, will make, equip, and release fully committed followers, disciples of Jesus Christ. Why? Because that's our mission. Well, Pastor Tony, what if they burn down the church? Then we'll do it in the empty field that's left. Well, what if they take the field? Then we'll do it house to house like they did before. And with greater urgency because we have less distractions maybe. What if that's what it takes for the church to wake up? I made this statement last week. I said the only, <laughs> the greatest governor to your success is your comfort. The greatest inhibitor to your calling is your comfort. We're called to reach people to, for Christ. But very often, the, the, the retaining and the retention of our comfort inhibits us from doing it effectively. Our enemy has turned the world upside down and brainwashed the captives into believing that they don't even want to be rescued. You've heard of the Stockholm Syndrome where people who were held captive actually develop an affinity. Let me tell you, that the little God of this world who holds those who are, who are living according and making their, them the God of their, of their own lives have been blinded by the little God of this world, and they're, they're, they're loving the very things that are destroying them. I was talking to somebody yesterday who was, who was absolutely strung out on, on methadone, a meth addict, and, and, and they kept going, this thing that my body so desires and the thing that my body so wants, this addiction that my body so craves is killing me. I said, there's, there's hope for this. Guys, that's every one of us. The sinful tendencies that are latent inside of every human being deceive us into believing the very thing that is going to kill us is going to bring us satisfaction. But we, we learn as we live that that. that that satisfaction is always held just, just beyond our grasp, and it always takes a little more and a little more, whether it's sexual addiction or chemical addiction. It's never enough. If it's never enough, then it's probably not the answer. Do you see that? That's what the enemy and that's what the, the casualties and the captives of this, of this world fail to understand. Jesus said this. He said, what do you think if someone has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray? Won't he leave the ninety and nine on the hillside and go in search for the stray? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he rejoices over the sheep more than over the ninety and nine that did not go astray. Now, if this is how Jesus 
would describe the desperation and the tenacity that he has for the lost ones of this world, how can we possibly think any differently? Because I want to say some things, and they're going to be hard for you to hear, but I want you to understand I'm saying these because I love you. I'm saying these because it's necessary that we say these hard things to, mot- us, to motivate us from, the, from a place of, of cognitive agree- agreement to, to, to action. It's all about one. You understand, when I say the church, I'm talking about you. Okay, would you just say that for just a moment? When I say church, I say me. Say, I am the church. I am the church. You understand? So there is no deferring. There is no they out there. That, that, that they is you. And when we come together, it becomes a we. But there is no, we are the church The church is me. The church is every true disciple and follower of Jesus. When I say follower of Jesus, you cannot follow Jesus and not follow his commands. You cannot follow Jesus and not execute his will in this earth. He said, my meat, my sustenance is to do the will of the Father. Is your will and your sustenance and the very food that nourishes your spiritual life to make disciples? If it's not, then it's not consistent with the life Jesus exemplified. Very simply, and, and let's just be honest, making disciples is so far removed from the average, average follower or average believer's life. Would you agree? The idea of me doing what is necessary to go out and to bring people to Christ and make disciples, like he said, is something that is so far. But it's the common call, not just the corporate call. It's the individual call of every single one of us. And how much of our lives are we dedicating to the one thing he told us to dedicate our lives to? And what, Pastor Tony? Uh, the gentleman um, speaking, Dan is speaking over at the Rayford site on this very thing. And he said, you know what? We, we hide behind our orange stickers sometimes. And we say, well, I'm volunteering at church. That's great. That's wonderful. That's, but that's not making disciples. Are you uh, contributing to the disciple-making process during the church service? Maybe, maybe. But if we wait for the world to come in here, the world's going to go to hell because that's what we've done. Do you understand? If we wait for all the heathens to come in here and hear the gospel and get transformed and saved, we're going to be waiting a hell of a long time. The reason I'm saying hell is because I was encouraged last night (laughs) to say hell a lot more. The reason I was encouraged to say hell a lot more is because we don't talk about hell a whole lot. Why is this important? Because hell is real. You realize I wouldn't bother mentioning it if Jesus hadn't have started the whole concept. You realize he talked about hell more than anybody else in the Bible. Jesus. Do you know why he, how he talked about that? You say, well, Pastor Tony, you're one of those hell and brimstone fire preachers. Well, I didn't say anything about brimstone, but we can talk about hell for a minute. I need to, I need to teach you a little bit about hell, and I'll, I will in just a moment. But let me get a little further. So, we are called to go and to make disciples, to bring them into the safety of the camp. But in first, in order to do that, to get them to church, we really got to get them out of the camp of the enemy. We have to gear up and we have to be prepared. And just like I said, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not shaming or chiding you for the idea of you being a disciple maker being far off. You've been taught, you've been trained that that's my job, that you just get them to church and I make a disciple out of them, Right? Let's be honest. Most of you expect me to do the heavy lifting of the gospel. You expect me to know that. Well, you're cheating. <laughs> it's not fair. I get to talk to you, and most of you are Christians. And because I spend most of my time trying to teach Christians how to reach unbelievers, guess who I'm not reaching? So I can quit this and walk off and go out there and do that. If you'll follow me, I'll do that. If you won't, then what good is it? You'll just find some other chucklehead to come up here and preach to you and abdicate your responsibility to him like we have a tendency to do with me. Now, I'm not saying this for any other reason than this is the common model of the American church. The Great Commission is not an individual, much less corporate, obsession or conviction. Would you agree? Yeah, I mean, this is where we are. All right. We've... We've got to train those who are weaker and less disciplined within our ranks to take enemy territory. And that's what this is about. I want to help you. We exist to make, equip, 
and release fully committed disciples who make fully committed disciples. It's, I'm here to train you. So now that we've got some of those roles established, the whole point of training, the whole point of church is not to say, I went to church. You do God no favors by being here. You do God a favor by executing his mission based upon what you learn here. All right, let's, let's, let's jump into this. So making the Great Commission a corporate obsession. Think of your son or your daughter or your spouse. Think of your best friend from high school. Are you willing to stand aside while they perish, while they drown, while they're swallowed up into the dark and an eternity in hell? You know, I heard somebody say we should talk about hell more. Back to my point. Let's talk about hell for a moment. Do you believe that hell is real? Let me ask you, first of all, if you have a Christian worldview or a biblical worldview, the Bible, Bible teaches that hell is a very real place, a very literal place. Jesus said that it was. So is hell real? Yes. Let me ask you this. You should know this as a believer. You should be an authority on hell. It's somewhere you want to avoid. You don't want to go down that road. Is hell eternal? Is hell eternal? Actually, the Bible says that death and hell will be cast into something worse than hell. What is it? Did you hear that? Guys, I don't know if you understand. Hell is a horrible holding place for something more horrible. Why was hell created? Anybody know why hell was created? Why does hell even exist? So God can punish nasty people. It's not why hell exists. Hell exists to hold in confinement insurrectionists, rebels against Almighty God. An insurrection led by a particular angel named Lucifer who thought that creation could ascend to a point where he could overtake the creator. He convinced a bunch of people to get, on his, get in his rebellion, and he did it. Thus, the war we're in. If you are not in this earth as a Christian, as a believer, with a heart that says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, then you are standing in stark contrast to that, and you are living as a rebel in this earth against Almighty God, who is saying, Let my will be done in my life and on this earth. There is only two camps, but there is one massive war with two major consequences. One, if you side with the one true God, you will reign and rule with him, as, with him forever. If you, try, if you side with your father, Lucifer, who is your father if God is not your father, what I mean is he is, you are living and birthed after the very spirit that motivates him, which is the spirit of selfishness and rebellion, the one that propagated the lie, which is that I can be as God, which was Adam and Eve's desire that began the rebellion of humanity, man's joint rebellion with Satan. That's why we're in the war. He's been fighting ever since for the deliverance of man. He sent the great deliverer in the person of Jesus Christ. This is a very real war. This is either theology in your mind or it is a reality. And as a result, your daughters and your sons and your parents and your grandparents and your soul has eternal consequences that it's going to face. We will experience, if we reject the gospel of Jesus Christ and the provision that God made in Jesus Christ, we will experience a devil's hell until such time as we experience eternal judgment and are cast once and for all into the lake of fire. That is not a good place to be. If that is true, and we believe with all of our hearts that it is, or we wouldn't be here. If it's not true, then God's a liar, and we can depend on nothing. No aspect of Christianity should be, should be considered true. But if that is true, it means, guys, we have got to be moved to action. I was looking into the eyes of a young lady, a young homeless lady yesterday, whose body was riddled and destroyed by the consequences of her decisions. Helpless and hopeless, and the only thing that I could see was my daughter. This is, these are not faceless souls. These are not valueless souls. These are men and women made in the image of Almighty God who will exist somewhere eternally. And as I looked at that little girl, I thought, under the right circumstances, my daughter could be this girl, strung out and helpless and hopeless. And let me tell you, what rose up on the inside of me was compassion. And what manifested as a result of that compassion, the power of God present in that moment to deliver that young lady. Will God supersede their free will? No. But I was talking to another gentleman, and I said, listen, I said, it's one thing for you to go to hell. I said, but it's another thing for me to stand on the top of that city and see the approach of eternity and not warn you. 
I said, if I don't tell you the truth, then your blood, when you die and you enter into eternity, will be on my hands. Do you understand that's true? If you know the truth and you don't share it with urgency and with clarity, the blood of every man and woman that you know that dies without hearing the gospel on their ears from your lips, their blood is on your hands. That's Bible. I will show you. If the watchman on the wall fa fails to sound the alarm, then those inhabitants' blood is on his hands. But if you sound the alarm and you share the gospel and you make it clear and they reject it and they die, your hands are clean. It's not just a matter of our cleaning our hands or clearing our conscience of the damnation and the destiny of others. Couple that with the Spirit of God on the inside of us that sees every single one of you. I see you as my brothers and my sisters, as having intrinsic value because you're made in the image of God. What if we begin to look at others like that and see beyond the, the differences and the, idi and the idiosyncrasies and the, and, the, and the stupid things people do and realize that there's still a valuable soul there? Until we do, the Great Commission will never become a corporate conviction. And especially never a corporate obsession. Our spouses, our children, our, our college or high school classmates. We can't be willing to stand by and watch them perish. Every soul in need of rescue is someone's brother or sister. Somebody's son or daughter. Someone who is loved and mourned while they're lost. If not by us, by God. So obstacles to unity of the call. We can jump right into this. If you believe in the sovereignty of God, then we must believe that this world is not falling apart. Listen to me, but falling into place. No, no, this is, this is tough for us to swallow because things could get bad. But what if the badness necessitates the urgency that brings about the revival that will transform this nation? I'm going to say this again. If we believe in the sovereignty of God, that man makes his plan, but God directs his path, then we must believe that this world is not falling apart, but rather falling into place. Why do I say that? Because he said, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars and calamity and are doing all this crazy stuff, don't freak out. It must happen. That's Bible. Guys, we've got the answers. There's no reason why anybody here should be surprised if a nuclear bomb goes off in the Ukraine tomorrow. And you understand that's a, that's a real possibility. This is a real possibility. You will probably statistically be alive when we see the next world war. It's been a long time since we had a good war. We're, time, it's, we're way overdue statistically for another one. So when that nuclear bomb goes off, or you go home and your house is not there, what are you going to do? Are you going to freak out? Are you going to realize, hey, well, you know what? God's still in control, and I still have a mission to perform. I'm trying to, with all of the urgency I can muster, get us focused on what God has called us to focus on and put aside the distractions that are marginalizing our lives and marginalize our, marginalizing our ability to advance the kingdom as God sees fit because it is urgent. It is dangerous times. He said in the last days, dangerous times will come. All right. In order to deal with these obstacles, sometimes we have to isolate and remove those things that stand in the way. So what stands in the way? How about our agendas? You understand that whatever your agenda is, it's inconsistent with God's agenda. Let your agenda go. But let's just get real for just a minute. The idea of the Great Commission is that we should share a common agenda. Fragmentation and disunity occur when our individual agendas consume God's agendas. We can even wrap our agendas up in things that make it look like God's agenda. Y'all ready for this? See, man has a tendency to substitute all of those things that are valuable for God for those things that are valuable to him and make it look like it was God's idea. Y'all ready for this? Let's do it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to make one convert, and when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a child as hell as yourself. I'm just, I was told to say hell more. As you are. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, what did they do? They went around and they were ardent in their ability and their desire to make disciples. And they made them. But why did they make them? So they could prop up the very system that held their positions. See, because we know at the heart of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, which Christ told us not to be like, that they really loved being up here on the platform and being looked at. They really, lo they really loved having those seats of honor and prestige and recognition 
and pride and all of those things that are a stench in the nostrils of God. So they ardently made these disciples so they could get the check marks and the accolades from other people so they could tell each other how great they were. Oh man, we got a big church. It's growing because we tell people what they want to hear. Obviously, that's always a, ca a casualty. Yeah, I had somebody come up to me <laughs> last week, and it was hard. I, you know, the message that, that I delivered at Rayford, it was rough. I'm just going to tell you. I was screaming and red-faced. I had to tell everybody I'm saying this in love before I said anything. And you know, that's always bad when you have to say, I'm telling you this in love. Stop it! And you, you, know, you beat them in the head. This person come up to me and said, Pastor, I want to tell you thank you. I said, I said, well, you know, my name's Tony. How are you? And, and, and this person said, I said, how long have you been coming? They said, well, this is my second time. They said, and she, she come up and she said, I think I'm going to make Rockfish Church my home. I said, why? She said, well, that's what I wanted to tell you thank you about. I said, okay. And she said, thank you for not tickling my ears. She said, thank you for telling me what I needed to hear, not necessarily what I wanted to hear. Guys, I want to tell you, you can tell your babies what they want to hear all you want, and you can go ahead and sign, seal, and deliver their tails right into hell. You can go ahead and tell your babies what's copacetic and what is, what is going to cause little conflict at school. Okay? You can go ahead and teach them all the garbage that you want to that's contrary to the Bible of God, and you can go ahead and just, you might as well just pat them on the back, and their blood's on your hands. Look, I love you enough. When my children were going in the wrong direction, I gave them the... Uh, the, the, what is it, rod of correction, the staff, of, you know, anyway. He, the Bible says that those whom he loves, he corrects. The rod of correction, GPS, global positioning seat, anyway. anyway uh, so I'd beat him. He said, well, you can't beat your children. Well, you do it your way, I'll do it God's way, and we'll see if your children are around. We'll see if they leave home, raise hell, and end up in jail. Because when you don't teach them to have self-control, if they don't have self-control enough to sit still in church, you think they're going to have enough self-control not to get in the car with that drunk or go along with those people who want to get some easy money and sell drugs and rob a bank? No! That's a different sermon. <laughs> you, you, you see, I kind of got wound up. I'm going to pull out a rag and start hacking here in a minute. Sorry. All right, see? There we go. Where was I? I don't even remember. So let's go to the next slide. Your agenda. You can't have your agenda and God's too. So repent. Okay, here we go. He has a clear agenda. So uh, uncertainty. Uncertainty takes away the very spine of the believer. You ever talk to somebody and you're having a conversation and you start talking about something that they don't really know what they're talking about. And all of a sudden it's like, well, you know, and they start using a lot of words and fillers. It's like somebody who's preaching and says amen a lot. Amen. Hey, well, something, something, praise God. Something, 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 hallelujah. The reason I'm telling you that is because I really don't know what I'm supposed to be saying. You see, <laughs> uncertainty makes me say things that are not clear and directive. I tell all of my ministers this. If you can't carry on a coherent conversation about the topic, do not get up here and try to teach on it. Did you hear what I just said? If I come up here and I try to tell you something that I don't have a thorough mental grasp on, that I don't understand. I, if I'm flying by the seat of my pants, and let me tell you, I, I, I love churches, I love pastors, but sometimes we are, we are lazy. We're going to get to that in a minute. I need to know what I'm talking about, especially when it concerns the real world and real lives and real people in a real world. I don't have time to come up here and give you fluff and filler words. When you see that, just recognize it. If you can't talk about it, don't try to teach on it. Okay, that's just a little something for you in everyday life because that's important when it comes because people will sniff out your ignorance in a heartbeat and make you look like a dumb dumb. We did a uh, uh, documentary this past weekend at the Rayford site. If it was online, how many of you saw it? Anybody see it? It was good stuff. God, creation versus God or evolution versus God. I said, at the end of this thing, I said, how many of you would have liked to have known this? And everybody's like, because there's certain times, because a lot of you in here, Matt, believe in evolution. You're wrong. You don't know. I know. Because smarter than pe me, people figured it out and then shared it in a way that I could understand it. I, but you've been taught this since you were a little baby in school, and now you, you've, you've accepted it, and you're boiled alive, and we as churches don't overcome the ignorance that, that keeps us in the captivity of that delusion. You understand that, that let me just newsflash, you need to figure out why what I'm about to say is true. Evolution is statistically, mathematically impossible. 
Even the leading neo-evolutionists now, within the last six months, have come out and, inte and been intellectually honest and said, this is, it, it doesn't work. As it's been presented, it doesn't work. Because I'm not telling, you need to figure out why I can say that. One, I can say it because it's true. Two, because it's true. But the other one is, how do you combat people who don't believe that or don't have the understanding? If I can't give you the empirical evidence, don't be afraid of science. Science, more than anything else, validates the reality of God. Trust me. It brings you to a place that you can't explain. It brings you to a place where it must be something. It, it, uh, that I t share with you about they come to the conclusion that scientists have created something from nothing. Big thing. Anybody heard that? Scientists finally created something from nothing which proves there's no God. Who created it? <laughs> and with what? Well, we took these protons, and then we took a magnetic field, and then we created something from nothing. Well, if you created something with nothing, you should have been able to do it with nothing. Oh, but you're telling me you smart people got together and took something that you had and made something that wasn't there? Ta-da! So did God. Anyway, I, but, but we, one of the first things that you abdicate when you reject God is reason, according to Romans chapter 1 and 2. The first thing an unbeliever lets go of is the ability to reason, so we can't reason everything with them until we bring them the truth of the gospel through the convicting power of the law which shows the condition of the soul and and that person decides to either repent or not repent we give them the blue pill of truth or the red pill of deception and say keep going which one do you want you want to keep living like that fine but i'm going to give you an option through the truth of the word of god i know that's a matrix reference and nobody knows what i'm talking about so i'll just move along but uncertainty will destroy your ability how about this one obstacles to the unity of the call pride I'm going to go real quickly through this. As Christians, we, do we, like the Pharisees, want to be known for how good we are? As Americans, do we want to be seen for our patriotism? Do we own up to our humanity and our failures and our mistakes? Do we, as the church, knowingly or unknowingly place burdens of perfection on others that we ourselves can't bear? Do we confess our brokenness here and then turn right around and fight like a caged animal with somebody who accuses us of the very brokenness we confess here, there? We walk around and go, well, we're all sinners. And somebody goes outside and accuses you of a sin and you're like, wah! <laughs> it's like, well, which are you? If you're guilty, confess it and repent. But don't get all upset because of your pride about it. You were in here going, I'm a liar and I'm a thief. And somebody calls you a liar and thief and you're like, what? I'll kill you. <laughs> so there are some subtle forms of pride that maybe we haven't considered. How about this one? Um, and this is, this is an obvious one, but it can be subtle. Making sure other people see us. I've had volunteers who waited till I walked around the corner so they could see me do, so I could see them do something. Hey, let me throw this out there. I was at an uh, outreach, and did I share this story already? I think I talked to somebody here about it, but I don't think I talked to y'all. I had an outreach, and this guy comes up to me, and he says, he said, Pastor Tony, you have the best volunteers in the world. He said, I never had volunteers like you. I said, really? He goes, yeah, man. He said, your volunteers are great. I said, you want to know why? Listen, listen to this. I said, you want to know why? He goes, yeah, why? I said, because they're not volunteers. They're disciples. <laughs> Who volunteer? Because you need to volunteer. <laughs> but, but you understand, there's a difference in a volunteer who executes a task and a, and, and a disciple who executes a mission and every necessary task that goes along with it. See, I can take a volunteer out and he can do something. He can do it for show and he can do it for a lot of reasons. But when I take a disciple, when a disciple goes out to do something, you know it. Because a disciple makes a difference. He noticed it. I was blown away. Protecting our image at the cost of sharing the gospel. Pride. What will they think of me intellectually? Will they think I'm not as smart as they are? I know smart. I know very smart people. I can just talk like them and fool you into thinking I'm smart. I don't need to know anything except what they know, and I become very, very smart, right? How about this one? Do you realize not praying and seeking God's help and assistance is a form of pride? I'm hurrying. I'm almost done. How about this one? Looking for a, a platform rather than a, than a need. D did you hear that? Number one mistake 
disciples in churches in this context make. We're looking for a platform instead of looking for a need. We're looking for a platform to occupy rather than a need to meet. Guys, this is just real teaching. That's pride. How about this one? Laziness. I'm just hitting on them all. Y'all ready for this one? How about this one? We get so comfortable in our seat, so secure in our service to the local church, that we think that coming to church is somehow serving God. We have zeal for hobbies. We have energy for for hobbies. We have energy for our finances. We have energy and zeal for our families. while While we leave a lost and dying multitude to perish just outside the door. Guys, if we put the energy, listen to this, into making disciples that we put into making money. You cannot serve God in money too. This world would not look like it looks today. You would not look like you look. Because you get the money, it makes you miserable. Because you have to get more to sustain the comfort and the lifestyle that you have. But if you serve God, if Jesus is your master, his yoke is light, his burden is easy. Money is a demanding master. Becoming more missional. Our mission is clear. Go and make disciples. Don't stop with converts. It's not enough. He said to teach them to observe all that I have commanded. That's why we teach. That's why we share the intricacies of the word of God. We can't teach them what we don't know. We can't know what we don't learn. We can't unify in something that we're not sold out to. Pretty simple. Taking a corporate responsibility. That's what we're attempting to do right now. We are attempting throughout the entire organization, the entire local body, Little C Church of Rockfish Church, to make taking this corporate responsibility something more important and a greater value than we ever have. And I'm going to tell you why. Because this world is in a greater place of need and desperation than it's ever been. Guys, if, you're, if we're waiting on a church down the road to do it, we're lose, we have lost our minds. They need to be doing it. But you know what? We can do what we can do, and we need to do it now. Every single person in here, if we engage, dream with me for just a moment. If just the people in this room right here took the Great Commission and made it a personal obsession, do you you realize, one, the church would overflow? If the churches overflow, that's more people going into the culture and the community. The community would look different. The community would stop embracing all the values that we look and become a stench in our nostrils and the nostrils, nostrils of God. A stench that damns their souls to hell. It would begin to look a lot more like heaven. It will never happen unless we do take corporate responsibility. Make a corporate commitment. It's one thing for us to come in here. What do you do when you walk out? Many of us are going to go home. We're going to turn on television. Or we're going to watch a stinking football game. While we're watching that football game, people are dying and going to hell. People are living under bridges who are ignorant completely of the word of God. People in your family are taking one step towards hell today and tomorrow and the next day. How about this, living a corporate role? You know, the call to go and make disciples wasn't given to an organization. It was, it was a charge that was given to you and to me. We're called to be salt wherever we live or wherever we work. We're lampstands from which the light of Jesus must shine. It must shine in our homes. It must shine at our work. It must shine in the realm of government. It must shine in the face of overwhelming cultural darkness. I believe it can and it must. We have to look in the mirror and say this, that I am called to make disciples. You must, it begins right here. Until you are willing to say, acknowledge, and embrace the fact that I am am called to make disciples. If you name the name of Jesus Christ, you are called to make disciples. We will help you, give you a platform. We're going to train you. Again, we're going to share some things in week number four that are going to put this in your hands and make it so easy and so obvious. But it doesn't matter. You won't do it until you see it is so necessary. I mean, I want you to ask yourself a hard question. Do we really even care Do we really even care if those people who are paving the way to hell so clearly and so effectively, do we even care if they're going to hell or not? Maybe revival looks like a repentance of compassion. Maybe we ask God 
to restore that first love for him because we recognize that we don't have love for those made in his image. You understand that's what happens to most believers. We get calloused towards what horrible things are going on in the world and we focus more and more on us. We try to keep a soft heart towards God as our heart towards others grows colder and colder and harder and harder. And occasionally God says, babies, I need to soften your heart in a different way and that's towards one another. That's where it really matters right now. We have to look into the mirror and say, I'm called to make disciples. I'm called to teach them, to observe everything that Jesus taught. I am to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, of the Holy Spirit. And whatever may come, let it come. I know that Jesus will be with me no matter what. And that's what he said. He said, go into all the world. Stand if you're able. Make disciples. And lo, I am with you even into the ends of the world. There's one thing we know. If we will embrace this corporate call, this corporate conviction, make it our personal obsession, he'll do it with us. The power to raise the, head, raise the dead, heal the sick, cast out devils will be with you when you go. Not while we're standing around here. Father, help us. Through your word and by the power of your spirit, I'm asking you, God, to ignite a flame in our souls like never before. Please, God, restore the first love for you to our hearts and the first love for humanities. God, let us not rest without seeing the faces of our loved ones burning in eternal flames. God, I know that sounds harsh. But if some of your word is true, then all of your word is true. We believe in you and we don't want to pick and choose. We want to respond. In Jesus' name, amen. 